All right, so this is the first time we're doing this on Zoom. So I'm gonna invite my friend Ivan and we're gonna talk about opportunities in outer space from a commercial angle. Um, so let me, how do you invite somebody? Invite, copy invite link. And here's the link Ivan. So I'm just gonna wait for Ivan to join. In the meanwhile, I'm just gonna adjust my screen. I'm waiting for Ivan to join. I'm gonna plug the agenda in our chat log. Oh, there we go. Hey, welcome, man. <laughs> um, I had to admit you, and I'm not used to Zoom, so this is all like a first time. Yeah, it's okay. You okay, can so usually we're, make. Yeah. We're. This is a recording. Uh, so that's a good thing. It's automatically recording. I didn't set that up. So I guess since we're going to be broadcasting this at some point, just as a little bit of an introduction, uh, I kind of think of you as an avionics geek slash also a space geek. Um, but it'd be, how would you explain your, like define yourself? Well, uh, I'm an aerospace engineer. I love technology. I love, uh, I started out in aviation and then slow and steady, like my interest evolved into space. So right now I'm trying to uh, build a CubeSat and launch a company out of it. Okay. So a CubeSat for whoever may not know, it's, what are the dimensions again? I, I made this. It's, uh, it's about 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter. That's considered a one U. But you can stack one use on top of each other, like in terms of sizing, and make them bigger. So there's two U, three U, uh, six U. Six U would be two, three U's next to each other. There's twelve U's, and so you can like make it bigger. But usually, like I'd like to stick around the three U to six U. Maybe if I really have to push it to twelve U. So like in a small set, really small set category and try to build a, you know, a bigger, broader, a futuristic product out of it. Cool. Wow, that sounds super exciting. <laughs> uh, so you and I, like just as a little bit of background for whoever may be watching this later, because I'm gonna upload this. Um, you, have and I, you and I have had, so first of all, we met through the New Right Stuff, which is a phenomenal course uh, through Loretta Whitesides. I learned about this course through the Foresight Institute because I'd been attending some of their salons uh, starting in the summer. So Loretta was one of the guests and I went to her website and I signed up. So we just concluded, like we just graduated on Monday. Uh, so it was a pretty awesome seven or seven and a half, eight weeks. And yeah, so yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. So that's where you and I met just as a little bit of a background for anyone else who may be watching. So I'm like planning to introduce like at least eight people in my network to this training. Uh, Cause I really think um, the training really helped me overcome, like at least put a framework in place to overcome some of the roadblocks that I had from a kind of relationship, so, so even like psych, psych, psychology perspective. It doesn't replace like a full on therapist. It, that's not what the intent it was like. It's like the last hump somebody may have respect to like some of the relationship issues or communication issues. So I really like got a lot of value out of uh, the course. But yeah, that, that's where we met. And uh, yeah, that, it was a very nice class. I mean, it's not something like I usually go to. I'm always more technical oriented, but I'm glad I did it. You know, it gave me a new perspective. Got to meet a lot of people, got to meet you. It, I mean, I also met a couple of technical people as well. Right. So, you know, it's, it was a wide variety of people from engineers to scientists to uh, artists. You know, teachers, etc. So there's a wide variety of people there. 
Oh, for sure. Yeah. My, my, the buddy I was like, so everyone's paired up with the buddy and the buddy I was paired up with. I kind of consider you as my, one of my buddies too, as like I said, on the, uh, on Monday. Uh, cause like we've been talking regularly. Uh, we've probably spoken for like seven or eight hours since the course started. Not that I was keeping count, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, my, my buddy is, uh, she works at JPL, the jet propulsion lab, but I haven't had a chance to like really talk to her about it. And like, I was looking up Chris Luecki today because, uh, like I've, I've followed like Luecki on and off for a couple of years and I, 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 I knew he's been instrumental in sending rovers to Mars, uh, at, at least to Mars, uh, yeah. with curiosity and, um, some of the other rovers, but I didn't know that JPL was the driving force behind it. So it's like learn something new every day. Yeah, actually they, uh, sent a, they actually sent a CubeSat, a 6U CubeSat, I believe called Marco, two of them to okay. relay, uh, relay, uh, the, the entry, uh, data from, I believe insight back to earth. That's the first time a CubeSat standard, a satellite, has left our vicinity and has like gone around orbit of another planet. Oh, wow. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's one of the things actually that, you know, proved to me that CubeSats are more than what, you know, it started out as. It started as a little project for engineering students in universities to build and test a small system within a one to two year period. Hmm. And that was where it started. It was mostly just people in universities, students, just messing around and trying new things. And through various initiatives, hmm. NASA and a couple of other uh, initiatives, like were able to send the satellites into space. Right, Over right. time, it has evolved into something bigger now, like bigger companies are building products around it. But the most important mission, in my opinion, is Marco, because that has proved that you can get a specialized CubeSat uh, to do missions that, you know, like, that usually are in, in the vicinity of like, you know, multi uh, billion dollar, like large satellites. So I, I think, you know, with multiple small specialized satellites working together, we can replace many of the functions that traditionally you would need a larger satellite for. Hmm. Super fascinating. So I know today we are pressed on time because you've got other deliverables, but I'd love to carry on this conversation and we can like slice and dice through. Um, the overall agenda that we set was to explore the commercial slash mining, uh, terraforming, you know, overall colonization. Colonization is a loaded word. So like I kind of look at it in terms of like, you know, let's call it breathing life in dead planets or enabling constructs which may not exist before like O'Neill colonies or Stanford Tauruses. So I think a lot of these things are invariably going to be possible within our lifetimes, uh, potentially in a 15, 20 year time frame, maybe a little longer for some of the uh, kind of manufactured structures like large scale O'Neill colonies and whatnot. But so it's a, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty broad spectrum that we want to cover. And uh, so that's one of the agenda items we set. The other one was to look at, uh, it's just kind of like a decision with regards to like hopping on existing payloads via a Blue Origin or a SpaceX or ULA, or uh, like, does it make sense to, uh, or, or Rocket Labs, you know, you, you have a wealth of information in that area or, or just kind of go in the DIY route and on what time scale would that be feasible? Um, and, um, one other thing was the book you shared with me, um, Elio on the Cheap. I haven't had a chance to go through the book uh, yeah. as of yet. But so these are the agenda items we said. I don't know if we're going to have time to explore all of these today. But let's, let's talk about like CubeSat because that seems to be like resonating quite a bit with you. And I want to know more about, because I think one of the things that happened is like historically the payloads would only go from like either. Um, One second. Yeah, no worries. Looks like somebody's taking a call there. <laughs> Just tell them you've got a recorded session going on.
Are you back? Okay, no worries. I'll keep talking in the meanwhile, um, so we can fill this gap. Yeah, so, they, so me, I've been talking to Ivan for like at least four weeks, like about a month and a half now. No, it's like six weeks. But um, yeah, we've had a lot of like, Ivan's got a, like a wealth of information. So his, again, so going back to his background, his core background is avionics. So uh, the day, day job involves working a lot of like uh, planes, airplanes um, of different types. I've seen pictures of him working on like Cessnas and but he, Ivan also has a background in entrepreneurship. Uh, right now he's in, enrolled in his master's in business administration. So fairly busy guy. So I'm really grateful to have connected with him. And yeah, we've had some really interesting conversations. So I figured we would, you know, start maybe broadcasting some of these conversations. And uh, as time goes by, bring some other folks into the mix as well to see how we can, uh, you know, how, how we can get like projects off the ground and, you know, do some good work and uh, make an impact and make some money doing so. So, uh, I'm back. So oh, yeah. So welcome know. back. So, so I was just uh, kind of uh, talking about like just giving a little bit of a background with regards to uh, yourself and what we've been talking about. So you want to expand. So I guess like historically, with like NASA, like, like, cause most of the payloads would go from like NASA to like, cause after a certain amount of time, I don't know when it was the only place that was actually sending like payloads into orbit was through Russia. But now, and so like everything had to be, I don't know what, what the reason was for things to be down to specification, but it looks like a lot of the stuff was using like legacy hardware, like, controllers and whatnot from like the nineties or when the like computation just kind of keeps increasing every year. Well, I mean, it's, it's very expensive to keep redesigning stuff. Innovation is, you know, important, but a lot of aerospace uh, innovation used to be on like a 10 year cycle. So it would start from like a design, you know, like very like preliminary talks. And it would take about 10 years to bring a product to, you know, market. You know, like today with like, you know, like cell phones being like, you know, come like innovating and computers being innovating like at, for every two, like doubling it for every two years. You know, people have gotten used to all this, you know, like new technology coming into them. But the truth is like the technology, like the basic, uh, like, you know, theories behind it and the basic fundamentals for it was long established. You know, people have been working on the internet since like 60s, like even World War II times, like we were trying to figure it out. And 60s okay. were when, you know, people were serious about it. And Bell Labs and many of the, you know, like uh, many large companies back in the day worked on these problems for years and years before it became mainstream. And like, we only see like the end of the, uh, when like most of the time, like we only know about the short time frame stuff because most of the technology is built on top of other people's existing technology. There, therefore, like when we look at a company like Amazon or Google, it looks like an overnight success. But everything they have, you know, where they use was built by somebody else before them. So it's like goes on the, uh, you know, standing on the shoulders of titans or shen or giants. Mm. And so technology, you know, it's not always what it seems. Innovation is sometimes very slow. Sometimes it looks like very quick. But so many people have spent their entire lifetime working on it to get to it to a point where, you know, it's a boom and like, you know, it looks like so many practical things are happening. Yeah, no doubt. But it's, it, yeah. And as coming back to the point of, you know, NASA does launch rockets. They just haven't been sending people into space hmm. through American rocket. There has always been, you know, like there was Atlas V that was constantly launching. So there were other rockets that were being launched for to send satellites and, stuff into space so it's not you know like they completely stopped or anything for the past you know since 2011 right 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 plus. but it's you know it has been happening it just hasn't been on the human flight we've been because it was just getting way too expensive and as for the legacy hardware it kind of yeah rocket technology even like the stuff 
uh, you know, with SpaceX, like the fundamentals were built long, long, long time ago. That is so true. Yeah. Yeah, the Russian, I was kind of like, so, I mean, it kind of goes to Werner von Braun. We've had like discussions about that, like yeah. not going to go to the whole history of like post-World War II and whatnot, but von Braun's like instrumental in kickstarting the industry, at least in a North American United States sense. Yeah, but, definitely. Definitely. Like, you know, he's one of the uh, key figures behind the entire, like, you know, like from the start to getting to the moon. And general. I mean, they had plans to go to Mars back then. They wanted to build, you know, a base on the moon. They wanted to have, you know, supply depots orbiting Earth. Right, so right, these right. are all, you know, plans laid out a long time ago. But economically, it costs a lot of money. Yeah. So, like, it's priorities. What is more important? For sure. Yeah, it looks like, like, after, like, like, how, what, what, like so, Juan Ron, I'm assuming, would have, like, immigrated to the States, like, late 40s, early 50s. But, like, it looks like, the Russians have done a lot of good work too, from like the fifties and onwards. Um, well, it's it all. I mean, like people. This is just a you know, like it's not one hundred percent like this is why. But a lot of people, you know, both in U United States and Russia, took you know scientists and important people, mathematicians and stuff, from Germany after the war, oh, and okay. they were like you know pick and chosen and divided. A lot of you know smart people who had the choice chose america well some people were forced slash you know some people also chose to go to russia you know it's not right. always everybody's forced right, and right. you know it was an evolution of the v2 and all the german you know innovation like all the bad things they did from the nazis and everything germany was you know innovating at an amazing pace back then so a lot of you know things did come out of the german scientists and stuff that were doing research and stuff during the World War II. I mean, I'm not saying it's all, you know, Germans. There were a lot of smart scientists in America as well. Doing, I'm not, I mean, and there's a, well, in terms of like rockets in uh, Russia, there's a complete different history for them as well. Mm -hmm. We don't usually see it in the Western world, but like, you know, it's, there are key figures in the Russian, you know, space industry. Right. That if you talk to a, you know, a professional from Russia, they'll be able to, I know a couple of names, but nothing comes off the top of my head, you know. Right. It's not something I study on a constant basis. I but, you know, it. they, ha I mean, it's a, two different philosophies uh, in terms of building rockets. They picked one, America picked one. Right. And so it was it just evolved parallelly and people copied each other. And there's a lot right. happened. You know, yeah, for sure. Time. Well, yeah, like, like looks like in a, on a 20 year spectrum, like with, with the emergence of, uh, with the formation of, not emergence, uh, of SpaceX. And then Blue Ridge and Falling Suit, and then a couple other companies uh, starting in succession. But yeah. it, I think most of the innovation has happened in the domain of, like, not to get too much into the nation state kind of discussion, but like with the vertical uh, takeoff and landing, and you know, like landings, like uh, rockets back on on the dock. Uh, you know, just like recently with uh, SpaceX sending two astronauts to ISS. These are monumental achievements. Uh, it, uh, can, can, like can, realizing that it took 20 years to get to some of these milestones, but these are pretty significant achievements. Like I would all, almost kind of if Apollo uh, like 11 was like a 10, this is probably like a five and a half, six. It's it's a pretty yeah, important. Yeah, I agree. Right. It's pretty important. Yeah. Right. So I guess the, I guess the, a good segue now would be to uh, like. Like, so I'm thinking like the price to send a pound in orbit, that's one. And secondly, the uh, enablement of the platform. So going back to where you were, sh like, you know, the uh, example you used of the internet kind of emerging with the ARPANET, going back to President Kennedy presenting the bill to Congress back in the 60s. And, you know, taking all these 30 years to like finally materialize and being placed in universities and whatnot. I guess it was ARPANET was probably in academia before that too, but it was it actually started taking off, really started taking off in the nineties. So I guess the question then is, and tying it back to the CubeSat, like how do we go about doing this? Like what's, what's the next like series of logical steps in your mind? Like what, what are you thinking of doing? Cause you shared like some, you've sh shared at least one aspiration with me. I, I don't know if yeah. you want to go public with that or, yeah, yeah, I don't. 
Yeah. I don't mind talking about it. I mean, it's not a you know new idea or anything. Right. It's been tried and tested, and that's a really people been developing. Idea. Uh, people have been developing this idea for a long time. I mean, like a twenty-year patent just expired on this idea. So what is that? Sorry, it's called fractionated uh, satellites. It's when you take components of a satellite and make them into their own satellite. Oh wow! Okay. So say uh, like a unique communication system, and all of them would communicate remotely via you know space, like you know satellite to satellite. Uh, radios and so you'd have one ground to a uh, satellite or one or two a few ground to space uh, satellites receivers and um, transport uh, radios and uh, so those will be like you know de dedicated to doing that one task while you'd have a few that would be dedicated to imaging and a few dedicated to uh, you know instruments like such as you know either observing weather or tracking ships or tracking airplanes things like that so you'd have these specialized small satellites each doing its own uh, unique mission but working together to achieve the kind of uh, to achieve a bigger mission basically we're taking a big satellite and dividing it into smaller pieces and uh, putting it to use. It's a little complicated, you know, it's uh, because, you know, to get it to a functional stage, it's not like you build one huge billion dollar satellite. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is build a few hundred thousand dollar satellites to replace a billion dollar satellite. Interesting. So I kind of like the example I'm thinking of is like a distributed mind of sorts. So yes. instead, of, instead of like building one brain and it performs the functions of the minds and if you know, whatever the limitation may be of sending it in orbit, if, if the thing goes down, it's really difficult to bring the whole thing back down and repair it. You yes. send it back in fractions. But there must be other advantages to uh, something like this as well. Maybe you can have like lenses that kind of span across like an entire planet or maybe the entire solar system and is just sending the data back to some, uh, maybe like a something like within the the solar system cluster or like offloads computation it, there must be other benefits too but did I you mean, it's, yeah. it's very hard to tell at this point but there are people you know like planning so many missions some people want to build distributed uh telescopes that can like let's say hubble hubble you know cut it like you know like when they did the first missions they pointed it towards the north where you can always be pointing at one direction. So like, you know, as you're going through, regardless of where it's, uh, you know, orbiting around the earth, you will have an orientation to, you know, pick and observe over a long period of time because it took very long to observe an entire, you know, section uh, off the sky. Because, you know, it's so far, like some of these, like some of these star systems are so far out as space expands and you know those those stars are moving away and galaxies are moving away from us it's you know we're seeing the light that's emitted when the when the entire universe was first born things right. from around the big bang so we're trying to like the more we have and the more area we can observe on a constant basis especially if you're distributed and it's orbiting earth you get, like as one satellite goes out of range for that section another can pick up and we can you know have hundreds and thousands of satellites yeah, observing yeah. various parts of space constantly and getting data so imagine just like we learned so much from just studying a very small section of the space imagine we can do it at a very very larger scale and a much more section i mean i'm not saying we can monitor everything and it's like it's impossible at this point at least like even like you know like we're one earth trying to you know study everything that's out in the universe right uh, but we'll have you know significant like it, it's an iterative process as we build the next generation will build even further and so it'll definitely lead to something larger i can't be sure where it's going to lead it's a very hard thing to pinpoint how technology gotcha. evolves as people get involved new ideas come in and things change cool sorry i was slightly distracted with whatever your roommate's making
I don't know if it's jam or jelly or <laughs> no, no, <laughs> like a lot of, I can talk to them if you want, like just point, Hey man, we're doing a podcast here. It'd be really nice. We just kind of point it down a little bit. No, it's okay. Give me a second. I'll let him. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thanks. Oh, I, I'm back. Yeah. Thanks for taking the action. It's okay. I mean, honestly, we can just edit these, you know, like the in between parts out. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Well, yeah, we can take action too. So. Sorry, it's it's kind of in the first time I didn't really set know, up everything all. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, just yeah, like, you know. Next time I'll be in a little bit more quieter place. Oh, no worries, man. It's just a little bit of communication. It's uh, that's another thing we learned. We had the new right stuff. Communicate. Yeah. Don't assume. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So like the, what I'm getting from that is, uh, and thanks for taking action there, um, is, is just like this distributed network, uh, is, is, is what I'm like, instead of sending a Hubble, we can send like hundred Hubbles and you know, like we can, we can get data from a lot more real estate. Uh, cool. and, and the, there's again, so many advantages, like if something does, Something did go wrong with Hubble, and I think it was one of the lenses, and they had to send yeah, uh, another blurry. mission. Yeah, they had to send another mission to, I, I don't know if it was to replace, I think it was not to replace the lens itself, it was like a module, I think, yeah. th that they had to take out, and it was, uh, that was quite a mission, man. Uh, yeah. But like, I mean, there now you, now you just, could just like, now you could have like one of the modules go wrong or bad, and you would just like, you know, you could just send like some kind of a device that pretty much just extracts it and brings it back and you replace it with something else. Yeah. I mean, as technology evolves, I'm sure that will happen. But here's the thing though, like CubeSat is small, still small. You're not going to be able to replace the entire Hubble. But what you can do is build distributed systems that working together, like as you know, five, six lenses observing or five, six radio telescopes observing and can get, you know, like working together can like computationally form a more accurate models and better views. But it won't be like the same picture quality, like, you know, a physical lens that's, you know, the size of a Hubble is not going to be replaced physically by a couple of tiny CubeSats. Hmm. But working together in a different, you know, model, we'll be able to get more better data over time and stuff it's and uh in terms of like the distributor model there's a couple of different type uh, type of them as well where one like planet labs is doing where they have you know the same satellites but you know just as a uh or what spacex is doing as a cluster or like you know a constellation and they're doing the same job all of them but just all around the world with you know hundreds of the same satellites but what I'm trying to do is a little bit different as it's fractionated. We're taking one satellite and dividing the components into more. But as I said, you know, once you start building, like you do eventually have to build constellations if you want to achieve some of the different kinds of, you know, missions. So it all depends on the kind of mission you want to do. And so if we can do both the fractionated and a constellation, there'll be more power and more democratization of space. Okay. So, sorry. Um, I think my session is going to end uh, around the 45 minute mark. I don't have okay. the paid account for zoom. So did you want to talk about like about your idea uh, and like which stage you're at and when do you, when do you intend to kind of go like full on with it as well? Did you want to talk about your existing strategy with like the app and I don't know how much you want to share. Um, no, I think it's going to like go way off topic if I start talking about everything that goes on in my head and everything I've done in the past. So what, how, mean, do you, how do you want to take this idea forward is the question. And oh, when, when do you, uh, want, like, what do you want to do? And when do you want to really move ahead with it? Well, I, I am actually moving ahead with it. I've been researching a lot, you know, it's in the first initial places. So I'd need to have to find funding in different ways, like clients, partnership with organizations, 
and so find funding to build prototypes. I'm using some NASA programs to test stuff. I have an engineering friend who is, you know, helping with the modeling of, you know, like the software uh, communication and control system and training an AI behind it to optimize it. And so that humans don't have to be as much involved behind the operations of it on a daily basis. So like, so, I mean, I pick like, even building a CubeSat, you have to pick and choose, you know, like what you can work on. At the moment, you know, like hardware is very expensive to launch to space. So we can test it on, you know, NASA has a simulation for CubeSats and small sets where you can test uh, component, the controls of components using software on, you know, standard buses and stuff. And so What's a standard bus? Standard uh, buses were like, uh, it's kind of like a, Frame slash, uh, like a like a fr No, uh, think of it like you know how you would put everything in a motherboard, like CPU, PCI cards, and stuff like that. Kind of like that, where it's like a board or like you know a frame where, where you can you know add components to it to customize your mission in a CubeSat or a bigger satellite. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so what what, is, what does your idea do in a nutshell, like in one line? What is the purpose of the idea? It's to uh, make uh, satellites even cheaper. Like we can make more, it's not in terms of like the cost of a single satellite, but instead of a cost of a larger mission, much cheaper. What would that do? Well, that'll do get more people, more companies, more data, um, just more of everything that's happening now. What will that do? So we have more data now. So give me a tangible example, like like we spoke about this in our one-on-ones, uh, which this is one-on-one too, but what what do you wanna see in like when this- Oh yeah, I'd like to build the- Yeah, I mean like this is like a beginning stage, like in my opinion, this is a big name to build more infrastructure so that humans can, you know, expand and you know like explore the solar system and beyond okay so you want to build a cluster of cubesats so we can explore the solar system in a bit more detail that's one yeah so you want to democratize uh, the this the exploration at least from a orbit to surface level uh, could could like host a, like you know pick up a whole bunch of other data too like maybe like uh, atmosphere you know like uh, I don't know what else NASA monitors, uh, maybe asteroids, but so you basically want to democratize the discovery and sorry, the exploration angle for solar system. Yeah. Like right now the, the CubeSats are doing that around our earth, more and more companies and universities and you know, organizations, uh, countries, agencies are, you know, using the CubeSat platform to get themselves, you know, all these capabilities and technology. But what I believe we can build on all that existing technology to go above and beyond and explore the entire solar system. And I think as we collect more data and stuff, it's going to allow us to, you know, have more manned missions out there as humans go out and explore the universe. And it's very hard to tell, you know, how fast these things are going to happen. But I'm sure, you know, like eventually a couple of generations later, humans are going to have a, you know, a permanent outpost all throughout the solar system. And it's going to be a normal thing to travel around the solar system. Yeah. I have no doubt in my mind that that's definitely going to be possible. I don't think it's hundred years out. I don't even think it's 50 years out. Uh, and I agree. It depends on how certain breakthroughs happen, but it could, it could be like 10 years till we start seeing the first settlements on Mars at least. And it would probably be 20, 25 years till we, see like space becoming the platform like computation was in the 90s because i think computation with the pc movement started taking off in the late 70s early 80s but it took up well to the 90s till it had some saturation in the market so i kind of see like another 20 years for space to be at that level i could be very wrong though this is a very uneducated guess it's, right, so it's, our session might end soon because yeah. like i said uh, zoom has a cap on 45 minute non-paid accounts or like free accounts. I'd love to continue this discussion. So I know today you've got some deadlines. So, but sorry, you wanted to say something? 
No, I mean, like, as I said, you know, it does depend on, you know, investments, how innovation goes. That's a very hard thing to predict. Innovation is not, you know, it's, it's not right. like, you know, Moore's Law where they predicted, you know, like computation is going to grow right. at, you know, twice the rate of every previous generation, every two years. Right, but right. A double, but, you know, the space is different. That's a very hard thing to predict, especially like now all the, the activities going on are low Earth orbit, mm -hmm. which is a completely different environment than as we start traveling, you know, further even to moon. So, I mean, we do have to be optimistic, but also we have to, you know, a little like check our own, you know, I don't know, check ourselves to reality a bit. I hear you. It's like that restraint, that be aware of the actual conditions as well. It's like the, the it's kind of like the Venn diagram, optimism and, you know, having a realistic approach, like how some of these technologies will mature. But at the yeah. same time, some of them may not happen on the time scale. We may extrapolate it to be, I think is the right word. Okay. Yeah, I um, mean, we have to keep an open mind. We never know, like, the next breakthrough. I mean, we need to have breakthrough. Like, our current rocket technology is not enough to do right, all right, that. Right, right, right. Well, the quote, uh, I don't know who said this, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. <laughs> and, uh, and like, the, the great one, Wayne Gretzky used to say, or probably still says, we should skate to where the puck is going to be. So I truly think, believe that, we're going to see opening up of the outer space uh, orbit and then beyond in a massive way. Yeah. I mean, the, like I've been saying this for as a non-educated person in this area for at least 12 years. Come on, man. That's not 12 years is not non-educated. That's well, definitely it, educated. It was an intuitive guess because I didn't have a background in uh, like aerospace or uh, it just no, uh, like, like with the work that, uh, it just, it just seemed possible. Uh, it definitely, I mean, it definitely could be possible. I mean, like as an engineer, like I'm always like constantly thinking about today's technology, not from my, like, it's a thing like, you know, I think of everything from the stuff I studied on and I base, you know, I base it on that. Right. So that's yesterday's technology. We're okay. building today's technology. Yeah. And we have to, you know, push to tomorrow. So it's a, three different level you know the optimist hmm. hope for tomorrow the realists kind of build today right. and the pessimists look at yesterday fair enough okay so we're so gonna have, like we're gonna run have out to of be an optimist time constraint here i want to ask you yeah, yeah absolutely I, I i'm with you but uh, like going back like you know so what is what do you need help with on this project or overall who do you want on your team uh, this could be a means to broadcast this information and echo it in the future. But what do you need help with? Well, I mean, honestly, in every aspect of it, we can always use improvement in every aspect. So can you give side. specific examples who you're looking yeah. to bring on board? Well, the business side of things, you know, I need people to help with, you know, getting new clients, getting people energized and like, you know, optimistic and inspired by the idea and wanting to contribute in one way or another whether it be, you know, like, you know, just talking about it to people or, you know, like working on ideas and like, you know, presenting it to, to, you know, the industry in raw general. I'm right. also looking for engineers, you know, you, you need to have people building it on a regular basis, what kind iterating of it, improving it. Well, it's a broad spectrum. You need electrical engineers, you need uh, aerospace engineers, you need mechanical engineers, you need, um, you know, people who are radio frequency engineers it's it's a wide broad spectrum that's like literally opportunities available for every engineer out there from software to hardware you know because we're still in the early stage of space even with like all we're doing all the cap capabilities we have it's still the infancy compared to the scale of the universe so there's definitely growth out there yeah, I forget how many galaxies. Two trillion? I thought it was 100 billion. Can you imagine the number of planets? And this is just this universe. It could be a lot more galaxies because we went from 100 billion to 2 trillion. 
and now we found gravitational waves. So I don't know how that plays out into the spectral analysis. I don't, I don't even know what I'm talking about here. But, but just to go from 100 billion to 2 trillion, like the, being the new estimate, there's a lot of stuff out there, man. And this is only this universe. Yeah, I can't, I can't even, I, I, I don't even know when we're going to get the first images from Alpha Centauri. But so on that note, and we're going to run out of time, what would be a really awesome milestone once your project kicks in and starts delivering results? Can you give well, me as we, Well, as we start, uh, you know, like launching satellites, that would be an amazing milestone. You know, that is like 1.0. And as if we get to 1.0, then, you know, we can iterate and build up on it and go right. to 2.0 and, you know, keep growing. Could you so get like, a picture of like the water, like geyser from Europa? The, you know how the it, Europa apparently shoots these geysers. Could you get like a really high definition picture of one of those? Yeah, if we sent it, there, send a couple of satellites there, sure. But it'll take, you know, years to get there. Right. Fascinating. So you're in a way democratizing like what NASA should have done not to make NASA look terrible. <laughs> no, they are doing it. I mean, there's right. a lot of funding out there. You know, I'm right. applying for funding out of these agencies. Right. It's not just NASA. There's so many agencies out there. And so, you know, it's like, like all the private innovation happening is kind of funded by government at the moment. Right. It's, you know, it's not like the, there is private money, but it's a mix of both. Right. So it's, we're looking like a true public private, participation yeah in, it's a private public yeah right cool man okay i just really want to drive in like that like the message of what you're looking for i think we need to make that a consistent team uh as we talk in the future okay. since we're gonna run out of time any like like last comments for this session no it was nice talking to you all right and likewise it was nice man. discussing all this yeah yeah your project got me excited the moment you shared it with me uh it, it would be super, I just always kind of wondered why we didn't do this much earlier, but there's probably- No, no, the people, people have been working on it. It's not, you know, I'm not the first person that's working on this idea. Yeah. I definitely won't be the last person who's working on the idea. Right. So it, there's, you know, it's, there's just so much out there for us to do, yeah. but we'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of look, uh, use the metaphor of video games. I was born in the eighties almost. So I saw like games go from like Pong to Pac-Man to like what they are today. But I was kind of wondered why we don't get the same kind of resolution for images from space. I mean, there's some like that are better than other, like Arizona has got uh, this project, University of Arizona, where they, sent, they, they have some pretty interesting higher resolution images, but I kind of wondered why we don't do it like across the board. They mostly have it from- we, we are, you should look at Planet Labs. Oh, but that's mostly for Earth. Yes, that's mostly yeah, for Earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like the other real estate. So it'd be super awesome to see the same level of resolution for some of these other celestial bodies. Oh, we definitely will in the future. I mean, it's, it's not that far out. We definitely will in the future. Now we're going to start with the moon and then Mars and then, you know, go both the other way and kept, keep going out. Well, you're going to be a part of that equation. So I look forward to our future conversation. So we explore this. Uh, some of the other themes I want to explore is the other commercial aspects that we can explore and should explore. I was just watching one of Chris, Chris's Lueki's uh, videos from 2013. There's a ton of good information in that video. But I also want to explore like the, I don't know if I already said this, the terraforming prospects on a near term you're at least kicking, kickstarting the process of uh, like the real estate where we know there there's no life unless it's yeah. floating in the atmosphere somewhere, um, which we should look for. I mean, like bacterial life and whatnot. Um, but yeah, so like, yeah, we definitely should talk about that a little bit more. All right, man, okay. it was great chatting with you. Good luck with your assignment. I know you've an assignment due. So uh, I'll talk to you more next week. All right, bye. All right, see you, buddy.